Firstly, Dr. David Strong, who's Chief Executive of Inbuilt Consulting, and he's Chairman of the EU's Energy Performance of Buildings Directive Implementation Advisory Group. Well done, David. And uh, so David will give us a few words, and then afterwards, Maria Atkinson, who's Head of Sustainability from the lend Corporation, will give her views. David, you first. Well, thank you, Greg, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hopefully we'll get the first slide up. Um, really, just by way of responding to Che, uh, you know, I think in the UK we could have safely said 10 years or so ago with the incoming administration that we appeared to be having an administration that genuinely cared. Uh, the, there was a commitment in the manifesto back then, which many, many of you will remember, to go way beyond our Kyoto commitments in terms of CO2 reductions. Those targets, however, very quickly became ambitions, and the ambitions became aspirations, and uh, it, the jury is still out, of course, whether we will come anything close to those original targets. And what we've also had, of course, over the last 10 years or so is almost an endless stream of initiatives, consultations, white papers, green papers, energy efficiency implementation plans. I'm sad enough to keep all these things on a bookshelf, and the bookshelf is groaning with weight now under the weight of consultations, and there have been consultations on consultations, two rounds of Treasury consultations on fiscal instruments to uh, drive the take-up of energy efficiency measures in the existing stock, for instance. So, we, you know, I think many of us are beginning to wonder whether the old adage of the road to hell being paved with good intentions is, um, is possibly true. Um, but I think Chase actually struck a very important uh, chord with me here, and that is actually providing objective evidence that green buildings pay. It is absolutely fundamental that we come forward as an industry with this uh, information based upon real empirical data uh, on things like productivity improvements in offices, footfall and profit in retail, learning outcomes in schooling, schools, healing outcomes in hospitals and so on. Because unless we can demonstrate those things and the, fact, and, and, and the proposition that we can actually make these buildings aspirational by marketing the power of the marketplace, then it really doesn't matter what the government does in terms of mood music and legislation and so on, uh, the, the, the market won't respond. So I think my point of view on this is actually we need both. We need uh, government to set the signals very clearly and loudly, and what we need is an industry response driven by uh, driving the marketplace in terms of, uh, of, of market demand for these buildings. I think it is vital, though, that government provides some leadership in terms of things like providing simple tax incentives and fiscal instruments as far as the existing building stock is concerned. Because the problem with a lot of initiatives like BREAM, the Green Star Rating, LEED, and so on, is that the principal focus is on new build. And, you know, we've already built over 80% of the buildings we will have in 2025, and about 70% of the buildings we'll have in 2050. So the existing stock, you know, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, it really is the existing stock stupid. So that's important, and that's where the marketplace, in my view, alone is not going to respond, and government has a leadership role to provide. And the situation on that is, be, is woeful in the UK. There have been numerous uh, select committee reports and other reports which have advised government that the need for tax incentives uh, to drive the uptake of energy efficiency measures in the existing market is absolutely vital. The other thing is that uh, government has got an important role in providing leadership as far as codes and standards are concerned, setting that minimum regulatory floor that Che, uh, che described. Uh, I have to say, though, that unless those codes and standards are very carefully thought through, there are real dangers of all sorts of perverse outcomes coming about if you focus single-mindedly on an issue like zero carbon, which can then lead to significant imbalance in terms of sustainability, with social sustainability issues, for instance, or economic sustainability issues not receiving adequate attention. That will lead to huge missed opportunities and potentially very perverse outcomes. And I mean, these are the thing, perverse outcomes that could come about from a misapplication of the code for sustainable homes, for instance. 
Uh, we are in real danger of building two or three million homes on floodplains, homes which will overheat in the summer. You've only got to look at this house that's being built outside here at the moment. That will be as hot as hell in the summer. And some of the early experience from exemplar schemes, uh, BEDSED for instance, which is a fantastic achievement at one level and has helped to set the agenda. Temperatures in BEDSED get to over 40 degrees centigrade in the summer, which is documented. So, you know, beware of the perverse outcomes that can come about. The other one which is really important and government again has got a role to play but, uh, and we as an industry need to be acutely aware of, and that is as we seal up our buildings more and more tightly to make them more and more energy efficient, then there are real and serious problems associated with health and indoor air quality. At the turn of the last century, we built our buildings out of about 50 typically natural materials. Um, now, we use over 50,000 compounds and chemicals in the construction of our buildings. The cocktail of those things potentially can have very unhelpful and very uh, unfortunate outcomes. So by way of summary, in my view, uh, delivering genuine sustainability, government must now move beyond the rhetoric and the warm words and so on that we've had. The codes and standards must safeguard against the perverse outcomes that I've suggested. Vital that we have some tax incentives, some simple market instruments that help drive this market. Uh, the industry, of course, mustn't respond through greenwash and again there are real dangers of things like uh, Bream and, uh, and, and, and uh, Green Star that you can build a highly sustainable school which ticks the box or purports to be a highly sustainable school but where the acoustic environment is so poor that the learning outcomes are completely compromised. So very important that we don't in, as an industry in this agenda respond just simply by providing greenwash and it is also vital, in my opinion, that we make green build buildings a worldwide phenomenon. Just doing this in the UK or Australia or, in, or the US is not enough. China and the developing world must respond as well. And there's a vital role for the World Green Building Council, with both, both Che and I are involved in, in helping to enable that. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention.